Lincoln and Catlian Streets at Totem Square is where they're going to rally at 11.45 and then their march will be here during the lunch hour to uh, Centennial Hall. So uh, please give uh, my wife Vicki Sitkins Against Family Violence and their Choose Respect March a little round of applause. She also authorized the uh, attendance of all their staff to be here. So good afternoon to safe. Uh, Marie Olson is a keynote speaker who is distinguished amongst the Flingit community and is one of three keynote speakers. It's with uh, a lot of respect and it's without a lot of proudness that the organizing committee calls on Marie Olson, who is escorted by uh, one of my nephews, Ishmael Hope, up to the podium. Please give a very warm welcome to Marie Olson. Good morning. Good morning. and you do a and and I'm very happy to be here and to address the people of my father, the Kiksadi. I have to tell you about my mother. My mother is Wushki Tanshawa, and she comes from Auk Bay. And so does my grandmother, my mother's mother, whose name I carry. It is always an honor for, whom, for me to come to Sitka because this is where I first grew up and became aware of my culture. Shingit is my first language. But after living and using the English language, I am sad to say that I am no longer bilingual. However, with the language program that has been going on at the University of Alaska Southeast at the Juno campus, I have begun to regain some of the language parts of the words that I forget. I remember the first time that a language program was introduced at the Juno campus. Catherine Mills from Huna and her sister Sue Bellardi were the teachers. And when I signed up for that class, I thought the room would be crowded. It wasn't. There were three of us that took the class, and I still have the notes because the language had already been written by a couple of linguists that lived in Angoon and put my language into written form, into written 
living form that allowed me to read and also allowed me to learn how to write it. And then along came Nora and Dick Downhour. I said, wow, that's the most exciting thing that has ever happened. And now we have a new professor who is native from Skagway. He's in the room. Lance, stand up. People will know that you are a professor of the language. So the culture is not only being taught through the language, but the culture, the history, the history of the, the most honorable people. I know we've been recorded as being fierce and warriors, but it hasn't always been that way. That's the way they saw us. And I'm delighted to know that there are, our culture is being taught through a program where the um, students are learning Tlingit oratory. It's not an easy job to learn Tlingit oratory. And some of the young men are like me, they're kicks adi yadi, and they're doing a fantastic job of teaching the culture besides the dance, the music, and even inventing different ways of celebrating the culture through a drum routine that is exciting because it not only are the young people doing the drum routine, they invite the audience to join them, and they can. I have been a proponent for a tribal college, and when Sheldon Jackson closed up, I saw that as an opportunity to have a tribal college on campus at Sheldon Jackson. And the young man that and I that worked on it, and that was Andy Hope the third. We were pretty excited about that. Really, the opportunity was there, but I don't think we were ready. But the, what is happening on campus in Juneau, to me, is addressing what we were talking about. Um, Clinkett, Hyde, Simpson Tribal College. It's still in the future. I know it is. As long as I am alive. And my friend and Andy. Andy was also a kicks at the Yeti. If it weren't for Andy, I wouldn't have become involved in the culture at all. And that was quite a few years ago, I think, 1996, 97. He worked on a statewide basis, and he put me on a statewide basis working with the Eskimos, and the Athabascans, and the Haida, and the Simpsiam. We could see the language 
in the future at that time. Andy was way ahead of time. He saw into the future. And when I realized that, we, we had a lot of conversations about our future. And that's so I see it as letting all of you know that you hold the future of that LinkedIn culture, all of you. You hold it in your hands. And when you put it in back into your brain, as I have, putting back all of this ancient Tlingit knowledge into my brain. I often tell the high school students that I talk to, you're putting your intellectual property into your brain. And when you do that, no one, no one can remove it. That is you. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you. Uh, not just the thing yet, and not my, my um, tribal leaders. It's all of you. I thank you very much for coming. And I hope that next year or the following year, when another Klein conference happens, and it will, that a lot more of the young people that are in the universities right now, and I see them, I often visit them. And I see some of them here, too, so, who I call my grandson because his father is Wushtitan. That young man is learning the culture very quickly. I thank all of you again. And I charge, I give this charge and this challenge to the young Thlingit men that are in the college now and women to make it your business to learn your culture so that you can come up here and use your language. My Uncle Jerry uh, had to make a quick errand, so he asked me to um, introduce our next speaker and also thank our last speaker. Um, these two people, whoo! Boy, they're, they're really like grandparents to me. They really are grandparents to me. Kaistan, Marie Olson from the Wushkitan, Ak Kwan, and uh, Cyril George, Kashkau, uh, Kakak from the Deshitan, and Kakwe Di from Angun. They've uh, just been these older people that hold young people in their hearts. And we're some of the, 
are very, very special people who, who come out of the thought world of the Thinget, the Thinget ways of being and knowing. And so that they've put us, they've held us in their hearts now, you know, it's our turn to hold them, hold them in our hearts and listen to the things that they've shared. Some of the, the stories I've heard from Marie are something like growing up uh, and being trained by a mother in Tlingit Tundatani, being put into seclusion at the time of her enrichment when you're becoming a woman by her mother, being trained that way. Cyril being trained, trained by people of his clan, also trained, uh, as he was talking earlier, he didn't have some of his maternal uncles around all the time, so he was also trained by his father. Trained in the thought world of Tlingit. So I've heard these stories, so I, 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 uh, really want want folks to find time to just really sit down and spend time with them. Marie knows these stories about growing up. She knows stories about being a, a labor activist. Uh, she knows stories about working with the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood. And she knows the Buktut Strongman story. She tells it beautifully, just beautifully. She knows the Salmon Boy story, Raven stories, um, she said that her mom made Raven a little rat. <laughs> that um, it was a way to tell the story and the Kushtaka story. And Cyril tells the cannibal giant story, Kusaka Kwan. He tells Akutat Sin, the Kiks Adi salmon boy story. He tells the Deshitan uh, migration story. So they have that thought world, that thought world of Shlingit. And I just wanted to take that moment to share uh, just complete pr appreciation for these wonderful tradition bearers. And also, if I could, just to thank as well, it was very special to watch this, uh, this clan ceremony. It's very special to see all of you and just a gift and a joy to be working on this um, clan conference, um, to be working with you and to be learning with you. And so now I'd like to ask uh, uh, and uh, I know he has a, a few other Ashlingit names as well um, that I momentarily forgot. But I'll ask Cyril George to come up. Gunftish. Thank you. Oh, my dad had a, had a saying in Tlingit when he was going to speak. Having good thoughts and good wishes for another person, that's a prayer. I've got a little story I want to share with you before I... This little boy, one morning, here, yeah, full of the devil, jumping around in a kitchen. His mom told him, you better behave. You better behave. Be good. Be good now. 
little boy. I'll be good for 10 cents. I'll be good for 10 cents. His mom said, why don't you be good for nothing like your dad? <laughs> I'm going to try to touch on a suggestion by my good friend Jerry Hope. what we'd like to do in the future for our young ones. I told him a little story. It's a love story. This is about the olden days when when our people were gone from village to village, capturing able-bodied men for slaves. In this one battle, the canoe was being pushed off the beach This young man, he was hiding in the bushes there. He was safe, he got away. As the canoe started to leave, he heard his child's cry. He recognized that child's cry. young man came walking out of the woods to be taken slave for the love of a child. So I think this is something that is born into all of us. That's what's going to keep us going a hundred years from now. We have, have feelings for our children. And all the teachings of our people, our chiefs, our grandpas, they taught us everything has a spirit. The fish in the sea, Animals in the woods. They have feelings. Be careful, you don't hurt their feelings. And then they turn it towards your grandparents. Don't hurt your grandparents. Don't hurt your parents. And then it will come to your family, your children, your grandchildren. It's good to Kind of pat your friend on the back if he's doing good. One of those saying that Will Rogers, he said, a pat on the back never hurt anybody. I've told this to some people that are talking about The deaths of our children are suicide. 
if a child is doing good, I try to do as I do. Sometimes I see a kid that's looking at like, boy, you look good, you know. You can see from a little smile that they, they appreciate. One of the things that kind of hits me right here, I've been asked to speak at the universities in Juneau talking about our culture, our language, our way of doing things. It just makes me feel good to see some of these college kids sitting out there looking up at me. They're not sitting out there just to be putting in their time. They want to learn something. What a difference that gives me a lift. to see our people. So what will we expect a hundred years from now? Our A and B. We started off with nothing and now we've made some changes. We'll keep on making changes. I'm always thankful for the time I spend in Sitka. When I attended Sheldon Jackson curriculum was designed to prepare me to be ready for a life. And I think we, I think we're doing okay. I'm happy to be invited to share some of my thoughts You know, our people had different ways of our trinkets are never take my dad and I was the only child. He never did tell me he loved me. When I was living for Sheldon Jackson, as a guy, I was the only child. He took me everywhere, hunting, fishing, or whatever. Cyrus Peck was going to bring me into Sitka on his little trawler to go to Sheldon Jackson. That evening, I remember my dad got a hold of me. Looking at me, this is what he said. I hope someday you have a son. You have a child. Then you'll know how I feel about you. How I found out six times. It's good to be in Sitka. 
You know, I, sometimes I think about, when I get to Angoon, I tell the people about where I used to play on a beach. When I'm sitting at home, 89 years old, So when I'm thinking about those childhood days, it's not the 89-year-old sitting in that chair. It's that little boy playing on a beach. How? And now, I think Sitka, one of the prettiest cities in Alaska, we're lucky we had people that had foresight. They didn't keep those foresights to themselves. They went out and did something. I tell people it was my luck that I was born in 1922. I got to work with Andrew Hope, Frank Price, David Price, George Howard, Pete Simpson taught me how to build boats. And how they would talk to us. How many people never spoke to us as little kids, but talked about serious things? Showing us how to even the take care of your tools that you're going to use for building. And now I see fruits of efforts of some of our teachers. And I say, I'm lucky. It was good seeing all of you. Thank you. How about another round of applause for Cyril George? <laughs> Wanted to uh, say thank you to my nephew Ishmael Hope for doing a little bit of standing in in the emceeing part of this. Uh, I'm trying to uh, fall in the challenge of some of the clan leaders and some of our traditions. Even though he is on the Raven side, he is still a nephew. And I, I just wanted to, in terms of the clan conference, start getting him a little bit of training in terms of uh, doing some emceeing. And so uh, I checked with my wife and he did a good job. How about giving him a little bit of a... <clears throat> I, I knew I could get an honest answer from my wife, so that's who I asked for first on what kind of a scouting job he did. And so thank you, Ishmael. Thank you. Good night. Good night. And stay here. I, uh, we're, 
in the transition of bringing in the uh, clan hats and the blankets, and they will be here on the table. Ishmael is Kiksudi, uh from the, uh, uh, as you would know, Raven Moiti. Comes from the Point House here in Sitka of my father's people. And so it's an honor to uh, have the peace hat here. And that is, of course, of uh, the kick study from the Battle of 1804 from the Russians. And that was their uh, offering, uh, recognizing the battle had come and gone. And they wanted to offer, uh, in their way, recognition of the Tlingit traditions, uh, a peace offering. And that's why you see the, the peace hat here. And so uh, I wanted also my nephew to stand here to give a little bit of balance on the organizing committee, uh, Raven Moiti, uh, Wolf slash Eagle Moiti, as we transition and bring in the clan hats. Arachutz, please stand as we uh, bring in the clan hats. Kurashish, Ishmael Kurashish. Please be seated. This is uh, the panel of the clan leaders, and they wanted their regalia to uh, support them, to authorize them to speak, to support them when they do speak, calling on those who have gone before us.
wanted to ask you to uh, give a warm welcome to the moderator of the panel, Harold Jacobs. Thank you, Jerry. It's good to see all of you here from Sitka and from out of town. <clears throat> the first Klan conference was in 1993, and everyone has been a good conference. Among the Klinkit, there are specific inhabitants, or Kwan, from the Yakutat area in the north to Cape Fox in the south and inland to the Pele Mountains in the Yukon Territories. Shingit Ani, the land of the Clinket. Mountain ranges and peaks, lakes, rivers, streams, creeks, bays, and straits all still resonating with the voices of our ancestors who named them and walked among them. Each of these inhabited areas had one or more from the wolf and raven moiety. I am a strong supporter of changing it back to wolf instead of eagle. This was what I grew up hearing, what others grew up hearing, what I heard and what early ethnographers recorded in the moieties instead of the usual eagle and raven term you hear. The changes seem to have come in the 1930s when the Clinkett tribe and the Haida tribe were recognized by the U.S. as such and the Haida system melded with the Clinkett system, although you will find the Clinkett wolf or eagle crest under the Haida raven and the Clinkett raven under the Haida Eagle. Each of these clans had one or more clan houses named after an event in their clan or their main crest or alluding to a main crest or a part of that main crest or history or story or imagery. Many houses were recent, some branching off and forming new clans and others go back to time immemorial with stories and sometimes kept songs songs going back even to the time before on the world flood. Keeping these identities intact was a clan responsibility. Clan leaders are born into their positions and are people who are charged not only with taking care of clan property, including the crest objects in the house and the clan house itself, but also of the songs, the history, and the names. One used to be able to tell what clan someone was come often by just hearing the name and they would know where they were from. Although there are some names shared by clans, related clans, but unfortunately this recognition unfortunately is lost for the most part. Other houses, other clans using names not connected and the lineages and the names are important and knowing who you are and your history. Once the clan leader is properly installed, they could never be removed unless you pretty much take their head off. He's there until he dies. There's no voting on these men. One important thing was is that the clan leader not be married to his own clan. I'm not talking Raven Raven or Eagle Eagle, it's their own clan. For that, they were forbidden to take part in ceremonial or public events, and virtually banished or shunned. And there was no correcting that. And even in my own clan, we have a story of one of our clan leaders knowing that his nephew and niece were messing around. So he painted red on his nephew's cape. And he saw his niece and nephew going up the mountain together. And he sent his nephews after them and killed them, had them killed. This caused a major split and rift in our clan, the people from Hip Clan. A number of canoes headed out from Taku, forming their own clans at that time. But my clan stayed behind, which is where we got the name, Nesteo, stayed behind on the beach. And that's why we stayed put. 
it's no longer, it is a longer story, but I just wanted to give that example of how serious a matter this was. There are clan leaders, Nasha de Hane, standing at the head of the clan, or Nasha de Nakhe, the plural, those who stand at the head of the clan. Kasha de Hane, also a headman, same term, and a Hitsati, a housemaster. People who are born into their positions, men who are clinket, not adopted. Singit Klein, the big man. I heard several times how one man had been elected as the big man of his clan. A big man is not elected. He earns that position by his work, his deeds, and respect, and how he conducts himself. Elected is too much corporate thinking. Elections came in with ANCSA. Now people think they can use white man's thoughts and be incorporated and do elections. This is about as nonsensical as ANCSA corporations trying to call us tribal shareholders or talking on tribal issues. It's not their business or place to be meddling in our cultural affairs. And I really do shudder at the misinformation that's being peddled by elected officials. Born leaders, inherited positions, titles, and names. We are clinket through our mothers. This is how we were created. And this doesn't change. No amount of money, opposite side recognition, will ever change that. That's just the way it is. Today we have many clan leaders, spokesmen, these people who have lineages telling who they are, none of them appointed to take over by our pretender or elected leader of any time. We still have our clan leaders. These men are the clan leaders, installed, recognized, and approved by the opposites. I've seen one great parallel to these men. In England, there is a parliament. I've said this before. I've said it at other conferences. I'll keep saying this. Their parliament is composed of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The House of Lords is a place where one inherits those seats and titles, and nobody can be elected to those positions. They are hereditary. The House of Commons, a group of elected people representing a majority. A majority of what? A popular vote? Over the years, the elected House, the House of Commons, has chipped away at the power of the House of Lords. And even not too long ago, they wanted to do away with the House of Lords altogether by voting to eliminate them. Today, we see the same scenario among the Klinka. At one time, our clan leaders used to meet with the governor. At one time, they used to bring their petitions of the people to the governor. But now we have a House of Commons and IRAs, elected tribal governments recognized since 1934, and ANCSA corporations, incorporated entities of all types that now hold the power and sway by popular vote and being able to fund elections. The power was, is, and should always remain with the clan leaders, men who are here by proper birth and even marriage, locale, and who they are by lineal descent through their mother, and never by a vote. Today we'll hear from the recognized clan leaders, leaders who for many, and I have heard one say this, if it was possible for a vote, he had never run for the thankless position. Fighting, yet they stand firm their ground in the positions they have been born into and installed into. Yes, we have our own House of Lords, our big, our big men, our clan leaders, our house masters. <clears throat> Hayayi 
Well, now you're going to hear from the leaders from Tlingit country, the clan leaders. There are many here today. This is truly the land of the Kiksade, Chuknakade, Kuskedi, Taktaintan, Kaguantan, Chukanedi, Wushkitan. Yes, the inhabitants of Sitka. Shakat Yohan Nashadanak is it here? Gaidanak. Clan leader, stand. This panel today. You will hear a discussion among this panel. This panel is going to be discussing clan issues going on today. We are not taking any comments from the floor. We want to hear from these men and what they have to say about these issues that are going on. This may continue on for a little bit, even in tomorrow morning's discussion. But for now, I'll turn this over to the head of the Sitka Kiksari, Anyanach, also Chichtetlein is his name, Ray Wilson. Kanashish. We should probably move up here uh, and kind of make it like a panel. We don't want to be too formal. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about uh, this morning uh, I guess first of all I want to say something about what happened this morning. Uh, I think all of you know that uh, we did talk about how we did things we showed it, and we hope that uh, it was good for everybody. The first subject that we're going to uh, address is we're going to follow suit with uh, uh, what Harold just talked about, and that's how how you become a a clan leader and what has to be done. Well, first of all, I want to Andy say a few words. On hoot. I just wanted to, uh, one of the things that we, uh, I like to do anyway, is uh, have a little bit of humor in, uh, in, in, uh, in these uh, get-togethers. But I was listening to my, my father, Carl Carl, in the keynote speaker. He says that uh, he was born with nothing, now he has lots. But today I tell you I was born with nothing, I still have a lot of it left. You are. By the time. We're going to ask Gunnathan to open it up and then we'll chime in. And if you guys uh, don't understand some of the things that he's saying, just go ahead and jump in and ask questions of if you don't understand what he's talking about. Okay? Good cheese. I'm going to wrap my head around this thing here. Uh, 
in our culture, it's like Harold mentioned a while ago. To be a clan leader, you have to be born into it. There's no election process. You're truly born into who we are today as clan leaders. We're not supposed to say I. It's supposed to be gone from our vocabulary, I. We're not supposed to talk about ourselves. We're not supposed to talk about who we are. You're not supposed to introduce yourself. And a lot of these things that many people are going to hear, you are not going to like it. You're not going to like what you hear. If you if you choose this, this life to be a clan leader, you have to get rid of those ideas of we, I mean rather I, and always consider the fact that we as a tribe will always stand together. One thing you're always charged with by the fact that you're born into a clan leader is that you always protect the tribe many times even from itself. And it's very hard. Our culture as a clan leader gets word, get, it gets rid of the word maybe. Perhaps the gray area. It's either yes or no. If you're going to decide something, it's either yes, I do it, or no, I don't. As a clan leader, you get word, rid of the word maybe, perhaps, what's yeah. And here's the other thing that gets a little bit problematic is that you do not say, forgive me for what am I going to do. Don't apologize for who you are. Don't give up your weakness. We are born into this. The uncles have to say, always my nephews. The uncle has to say, this is the nephew that's going to take after me. He either gets up in the party or he calls the other chiefs over to his house and say, Takasawa. And he'll acknowledge that one that is going to take his place. And when they're putting the hat on you, you don't put the hat, they don't put the hat on you. You have to stand up underneath it and take it away. Hence the word, atunahugud. And it's always with great respect because the other, the other clan, the, the opposite tribe, has to really make sure that this is the one they're going to acknowledge. The opposite clan 
has to acknowledge the fact that you are going to be who you are as a clan leader for your clan. Nobody else. They told me something a while ago about the hats. Most often, our culture doesn't always tell a lot of things about itself. We do not want to make our culture vulnerable by letting out certain things. That way we protect our culture. Most often, it's always hidden by something that is masking what we're really doing. Many times, only we as clan leaders know what we're doing. To others, it may mean something else, but we know what we're doing. When the hats came out here, they put their hats out here, they put their flag out here, so to speak. That gives them the power to talk. That gives you the power to talk. That's your time. That's your flag. That's why the elders always say, watch what you say. Your words as a clan leader has to last 10,000 years. So when you speak, you must always speak with great respect so that the generations, the grandchildren, their grandchildren are always going to respect you. Not personally you, but the hat that we wear. You. Yeah, and uh, Anna Hoots, uh, can you come up here for a minute? Uh, can you just say a few words about the... Uh, but when we go to a party and we make, uh, when they do the ceremony of putting the hat on us, you know, like the port of law, that they outside when it's done, okay? Uh, yes, uh, one, of, one of the things we're uh, trying to do here is explain a lot of what we do, who we are, why we do it. So everything that, that is happening here uh, this morning, uh, we're, we were using up our time, but uh, instead of talking about it, we were actually doing it, what, what you saw here this morning. And one of the things that, uh, in, in uh, the good way of life, wh when we have a payoff party, it's a call to kuik, that is our court of law. Everything is done at a kuik. The names are given, given. Adoptions are made, and uh, a lot of decisions. And that, the hats also, when you when you bring them out, that like my uh, brother-in-law was saying, it, it gives you the right to speak uh, when your hat is there. So when when there's a, a leader mate uh, at one of the colleagues, that is the way it is. That that uh, that that's that's it. That is our court of law. Uh, I, I think get payout party a quick. So, yeah. Well. We're gonna ask. Uh, yes, no. Woo. Come up and, and talk to us about a little bit about the the money part.
I know a lot of us have heard the term killing money. That's easy answer. It's when I give all my money to my wife. Hagwanton. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, a lot of we the, the term killing money and what we did to Ray earlier was we, we killed him with love, recognition. And in a koyik, the payoff part where we're, where we're paying off our guests, when we kill money on our atu, our blankets, our names, our houses, that amount is to be distributed to the guests equally. It can't be taken out of the, the hat and put somewhere else. When the term killing, there was a time when man was considered money. And that's where the term killing money comes from. We would, we would kill another human being and we would ask for a match. So whenever you put your money out on these objects or a name, if somebody else wants to match it, and they can, and they overdo it, then they can take that object. And that is what I've been taught. Um, we, we, we have a, a, when a person talks about his, uh, ooh, that person has put out a lot of money already. And when that, that happens, um, he has all the right to, to wear it. Normally a clan leader would sit with a black bandana on his head and wear a gray blanket and he'd dress up his grandchildren. That's where we start talking respect. And that is why we have, we, we, when we pay off our opposites, that is to pave the way for our grandchildren when their time in need is needed and it is a very intricate, very intricate type of koyik. We're not only paying back what love and respect that we'd received, but again, we are paving the way for our grandchildren. Yes, yes, at a koyik, insults were mended. In other words, we would take the scar away from not only our... Okay. The question was, is there a... Is there a, a long time ago, did they make payments for when they, uh, when they made insults? Or, when they insulted somebody, how did they have to resolve that issue? That's a, that's a good question, Ray. Insults were paid with blankets, chill cat blankets. Um, major insults were paid with, I would say, when a person is given, let's say, a, a raven was giving a an eagle, uh, an eagle blanket as a payment, that's a big payment for an insult that may have happened. And that's, that is one of the reasons why, again, we, we say, be careful what you say, because scars will last a long time. And at a payoff, when, when that is done, it is done publicly. Um, I've had to make a few of those payments for other people's comments. And, and it costs. I've, I've given away Shuck Yetz as payments. I've given war helmets as payments at a koik, and that, that takes away the scar. And, and you know, it, it, this the saying, what, when, when you say something wrong, you, you put a mark in a fence. 
that mark is always going to be there. But when we make these payments in our culture, that mark is taken away. And that is one of the beautiful things that we have in our cultures. And that is why, one of the reasons why we don't really fight amongst each other anymore. In the old days, you always said uh, when they made, uh, if the payments weren't made, is this cause of war or when it wasn't with no restitution? We're talking balance now. Yes, balance is why we... Today is why we, we speak to one another in, in terms to keep balance. Even in our songs, we try to keep that balance out of respect, out of respect and their love for one another. There was a time where, of course, you were saying we, we, we fought amongst each other. And when, when a person would die on Dejitan land, that payment was also paid with another life of equal status. And songs were written about these incidents and are still sung today. I think we only had a short time and uh, is that what he told you? Jerry, you're on? Are, do we just go ahead or do we break for lunch? Yeah, or Jerry, yeah. Or Steve. Yeah, uh, as most of you saw, it's been a pretty heavy morning for us, and uh, it would be, if it's all right with you guys, we'd like to go ahead and break for lunch. If you, if you noticed, while I was speaking, I was, be, I was, I acknowledged my, my mother and my sister, Aunt Shawatki and Gunnar Shaw, um, I would look, look at them because it's the women that orchestrate what the heck's going to be going on next more, in most cases. So, you know, before I really start saying anything, I'm looking at for nods from, from the women. And, and uh, be, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm clear on that area, okay? I don't want to pay any more money. Yeah, my father uh, beat me to the punch here. I keep looking up at my Deshitan uh, aunties. So uh, could you stand up, Selena and uh, Katrina? These are my Deshitan aunties. Welcome. I guess we're done. Yeah, with that, we're going to break for lunch. Thank you for listening to us.